thought uh, I, I had, uh, I did not bring my right juju today. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you very much for coming. And uh, uh, what I want to talk about today is to share with you the work that we're doing to uncover new sources of knowledge for Africa. Because the tradition is to assume that Africa is the land of orality, of songs and dances. And that, of course, as my colleagues, historians, you know, oral sources have also been used and defended as a legitimate, as a legitimate form of knowledge. But they're not only oral sources in Africa. And what I want to do is to share with you what we miss when we continue to overemphasize oral traditions of Africa. Because in fact, in many parts of Africa, people have been reading and writing for at least a thousand of years before the colonial encounter. And those traditions endured in many parts of Africa. Lessons from travel narratives and colonial archives on Africa underscore the need for more studies enriched by the body of written materials in African languages, in non-Roman scripts, particularly in Muslim Africa, where orality and written literacy are interlaced. A poem is written, is designed to be chanted. The song is also written. Where do you draw the line? These dichotomies, as dichotomies that try to separate the visual and supernatural world, the written and the oral, are Western traditions. In African traditions, these are complementary, a form of continuum. We would see poems and materials that challenge our dichotomies. Where do you put a poem that curses Adolf Hitler, but begins with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim? It is a secular poem, it is a religious poem. These sources force us to rethink the way we study Africa. So these materials and all this to be unearthed across Africa that Usman Khan calls non uniform African intellectual materials. Intellectuals who have been writing and producing knowledge in non uniform languages. African languages in Arabic, who often miss when we study Africa. And I'm particularly interested in a group of that large group of non European intellectuals. I'm interested more in the group who use the modified Arabic script to write African languages. And that tradition is what we know as Ajami. The word actually has a very interesting history. It was initially used to refer to Persians as barbarian, as inferior to Arabs. It was derogatory. The term later evolved to mean the modified 
modification of the Arabic script to write languages that are not Arabic. So the traditions in Africa are not exclusive to Africa. In Spain, in Andalus, you had la literatura al hamiada which is the same tradition. So the descendants of the Moriscos modified the Arabic alphabet to write Spanish. The same was done for Portuguese. In the Americas, some slaves who were more literate than their masters, one example is Abu Bakr al Siddiqui from Jamaica. When his master realized that he was more educated than he was, asked him to keep record of the plantations. And he did so using Arabic script, writing English. So English agony exists. <laughs> and that makes sense. Because Islam has come to these areas at least 1,000 years before the colonial encounter. What is Ajibri? It's pretty simple. <coughs> the Arabic script has 28 letters. Many world languages have more letters than more sounds. So Wolof, for example, have P, and Arabic does not have P. All of has G, N, all these sounds do not exist in Arabic. So what the Wolof do, have done, they have taken the B. In Arabic, this is B. This is B. So what the Wolof have decided to do to write P, they are three dots on top. Sometimes the dot is below. The Hausa may decide to use two dots. It's always about the dot. Always about the dot. <laughs> For linguists, these are diacritics. You would call this devoicing. But because it's not standardized, you may find the text two letters. And these have been used by outsiders to claim that this is undecipherable Arabic, bad Arabic, because they cannot penetrate Ajabi text. But the reality is that these variations are obstacles for outsiders, <laughs> because insiders are familiar with the variety of texts that circulate in their community, and they can predict what is the right account. So it is not. In fact, it's so interesting that these variations have actually excluded outsiders. But this tradition is not different from the same tradition you find among the Uyghurs in China. Chinese agony exists. And it makes sense because, as David during you noted, scripts generally follow religion. Whenever Christianity had traveled around the world, it has brought the Roman script, right? So wherever Islam has traveled around the world, it has also brought the Roman script, uh, the Arabic script. Most of these traditions emerge as part of pedagogies to disseminate Islam to illiterate masses. Recent evidence indicates that, Arabic, that the Arabic orthography itself developed following patterns observed in Ajami traditions. In fact, according to Daniel, the corpus of pre-Islamic Arabic language ins ins inscriptions dated from 328-568 CE were written in Nabataean, which was an early Arabic script. And Daniel notes that Arabic writing emerged from Nabataean writing of Middle Aramaic script which was used around the turn of the common era. So what these early Arabs did, they modified the Aramaic script 
by adding dots to write Arabic. That's what produced Arabic. So it's not different from what the Ajamis are doing in, in War of Land, in Hausa Land, in Andalus, among the Portuguese, it's the same process. It's always about the dot. How many dots? Where is the dot? <laughs> it is not different if you think about the history of Latin. In Spanish, Montaigne is written with Matilde. In French, Professor Humbling knows and would tell his students it's GN in French. <laughs> So this is a good source for those interested in understanding that these are long period processes. The scope of Islam and the Arabic script is wide and is little understood. In Africa, we've identified over 80 languages with major Ajamic traditions. Yet these traditions have been excluded Lightly excluded in knowledge production about Africa. That's amazing. Why is Ajabi, why has it been neglected thus far? African Ajami literates are generally misrepresented in official literacy statistics because literacy is often defined as the ability to read and write in European languages and the ability to use the Latin-based alphabet. So, if you're not reading and writing in French, Portuguese, or English, you may have been writing a thousand of years before the French, but you're still illiterate. And that's so interesting. This understanding of literacy espoused by African governments, the post-colonial governments, continued colonial policies, and international organizations such as UNESCO continue to exclude millions of Africans who use Ajami for everything. It's not only religious. They learn their business, journal, family, records. The rich Ajami materials refute the myth of the holistic illiteracy of Africa that is perpetrated by the overemphasis on oral traditions of Africa. There are oral traditions, those are one, they form one component of the larger African library. And they have written traditions, colonial archives, they form one component. Uh, like the African library, these written sources form another component of the African library. We have all the indigenous forms of writings, and I will touch on one, that form another component of the African library. So the African library is multi layered and includes both written and oral, not only oral. And I think this problem is partly a problem that scholars have created as they try to legitimize oral sources as important sources of knowledge, especially in the confrontation of what is supposed to be African sources of knowledge of historians. I think it's time to go beyond that. It's time to see what is in these sources, what we are missing. At Boston University, we have a project called the African Agony Library. The collection now has, uh, by May, we will be having over 30,000 pages of Ajami documents from major languages, Wolof, Hausa, Ulfulde, Kanuri, Malagasy, we have 6,000 pages of Malagasy Ajami material. So when I look at these materials, these are the major themes that emerge. Talismanic protective devices, Astrology, divination, religious and didactic materials in prose and poetry, 
elegies, translations of work on Islamic metaphysics, jurisprudence, Sufism, translation of the Quran from Arabic into African languages, secular writings such as commercial and administrative record keeping, family genealogies, records of important local events, Why is this thing moving and <laughs> I think it's my duty to scan it back. <laughs> Biographies, political and social satire, advertisements, road signs, public announcements, speeches, personal correspondences, traditional treatment of illnesses, medicinal plants, incantations, history, local customs, ancestral traditions and text on diplomatic matters, behavioral costs and grammar. And we're missing a lot by ignoring these sources. That is the lie. It is fair to study America without including English sources. <laughs> is it fair to study the French without including French sources? We continue to study Africa without including Africa. I think we owe to the new generation of scholars to complement their training by making sure that they have access to the insights of these sources. So this is, for those who don't know, Senegal recent project where these new naturalized Senegalese uh, were not long ago. We conducted a project funded by the British Library to digitize 17,000 pages of Mandinka Ajabi materials, which, was, which we did, we just wrapped up, and it should be online by May in this region. This is one cover made with a lion skin of a book of jurisprudence. According to the order, it's about 300 years old. There are many documents that we have preserved. But one fundamental discovery that is so interesting is that in their curriculum, these scholars are multilingual and their pedagogies are multilingual. This text is an excerpt of over 150 page document where the teacher has asked the student to write a poem in one particular genre in Arabic and the professor, as the professor does here, comments <laughs> on every word. <laughs> so the entire document is filled with comments and the comments can be multilingual. Because the teacher is Mandinka and he's grading a document in Arabic. If he comes to a point where he remembered he has taught this issue in Mandinka, he will comment in Mandinka. Remember, I told you this in Mandinka. If he has quoted another scholar in Sorinke, and has taught you that, you remember I told you this in Solinke, so the languages that are here are multilingual. Because they draw from multiple sources. This is part of the tradition. This is, this is your good friend Ablai. He's a research uh, team, local team director, and here we arrived to a place and we were given two manuscripts. The one I hold has about 1,200 pages and the other one had about uh, 1,000 pages and we were about to get ready to digitize them. And the man in the middle is our local facilitator. He's the one who introduces us to, who introduces us to the community. And then once we have approval of life, and the cameraman are digitizing the materials and we upload them 
in Google Drive at Boston University and we process the metadata and make them available. This is a colleague who was there to train the technicians of the quality of the, uh, to make sure that the pictures that are taken meet the highest quality for a preservation but also dissemination. The types of scholars that we meet. There are basically three types of scholars. Academic scholars I call social scientists. Just like social scientists. They conduct field work. They gather information, they analyze, they do peripatetic learning, they synthesize, they give footnotes of the sources, they analyze information and they produce information based on social science data. And the second group is a group that I call esoteric scholars. These are the, the people who are interested in metaphysics, in astrology, in divination, in healing techniques, and then you have poets and singers who actually chant some of the writings that these people write so that the masses, the illiterate masses, can understand. So you can see, so you can again see where do you draw the line between oral and literature. I use this categorization simply to show that these are the major trends of the scholars I have seen. It does not mean that one cannot be a social scientist and also a great poet. In fact, they cut across these categories. This is an example of one. Mahmoud who wrote one of the most popular books among the Muri. And it's so interesting if you read the reason why I wrote my book, because that actually was after I read his book. Because it was completely different from the narratives that I have read in the academic literature. And his Ajami book is the book that the Murids read. It's their own version of who is Cha Amur Bambo, what's his history. And it, it contrasted sharply. They describe the same events. Colonial sources describe the same events as the Murid sources. So the perspective. I had to write, I had to engage with these sources. So this is a short one, but it's very powerful, and it brings new insights that are fundamental to understand why the movement did not fail the way the French predicted, for example. I know the document that is interesting. And this is important for historians, Professor Zimmerman and then Professor Miran, historians of Africa. In this document, you will find that, in fact, letters are used for dates. This book was talking about the genealogy of the Mbake family, the family of Sheikh Abdul Bamba, and he said, and he was born in the year Aikashi and died in the year Yurushi. For many people, if you don't know, you think this is gibberish. It doesn't make sense it's in Wolof. When in reality, this is a system because each of these consonants have a numerical value. The Y stands for 10, the K stands for 100, the SH stands for 1,000, that's 1,110 in the lunar calendar. He died, the year Yurushi, the Y stands for 10, the R stands for 200, the SH stands for 1,000, that's 1,210. If you convert this to, to the Gregorian calendar, this is what you get, 1698 and 1795. So, people who say they don't have dates, they don't know the system, the system of dates. They are dating with photographs. And I think this will be illuminating the importance for historians of Africa. 
In many of the documents that we find, this is the dating system that you have in the color form at the end. But I call, this is good for anthropologists uh, since I'm, I have drifted toward anthropology since I left here. And anthropologists like to talk about ethnicity and kinship. And in Africa, ethnicity has often been used to emphasize ethnic conflict, ethnic tension. The documents like this one tell us that actually ethnicity is very flexible, very plastic in parts of Africa. The reason why among the Wolof, what makes one Wolof is not your blood, it is your linguistic and cultural knowledge that makes you Wolof is captured by documents like this. And documents tell us the people, the Fulani people, one particular family, which is the market family, that moved to Wolof land, it traces the genealogy to the first person who became monolingual. And it shows the, the ethnic composition of Wolof people. And it makes us understand why the Wolof have a proverb that say last names have no home. Because the Wolof have seen themselves as cosmopolitan, as multi ethnic. And of course, the person gives references of the source in Wolof. to highlight the diversity of knowledge. I journey in medicine. I extracted this from a table of content of a medicinal manual of Wolof. Louis Fat Sotchent. Clearly this is not Arabic. Louis Fat Sotchent. What he is Barisella. Louis Fat Tawatibat Jumbanodon. What he is any type of eye pain. Healing rheumatism, stomach ache, headache, sore, sore throat, toothache, healing someone who cannot urinate, benefits of the parrot's tongue for healing children with this disorder. I haven't tried any of these. <laughs> but to show you the diversity of things. This is an interesting one. This shows when the balance of power between European and Africans were the same. Ajami was recognized as a diplomatic means of communication. When the balance of power shifted, the descendants of King Bar are all treated as illiterate. This was a document I found in the archives of Aix-en-Provence. When we met there, And this document was interesting is that the King of France, Louis XVIII, was traveling in the Gambia River. And there is a group called the Nyominka in Senegambia who were experts on fishing and navigation. And they informed their king that there is a group of Europeans crossing. And the king asked them to stop them and to ask them why they're in our land. What's their problems? They had boats that could stop them. They stopped them. What are you doing in our land? Just let us know. And the king of France said, no, we're here for peace. We're looking for a trading post. We want to do business. And the king of Bar said, okay, good. I'm interested in business. So make your proposition, give me a proposal. What do you want? What are the conditions? What, what do you want? Let me know. And the Louis the 18 asked his scribe to write down 
the draft contract, which is a part in French. And the king of Bar asked his own scribe to respond to that proposition, which is the agenda. Clearly, at this point, King Bar was not regarded as a leader. Ajami was a language and a system of diplomatic communication. When colonization, when French colonization took over Senegal and the English took over the Gambia, King Bar and his descendants are today regarded as illiterate. But Ajami is not only used for serious stuff, it's also used for day to day. <laughs> it's not a dead process, it's not a dead tradition. This is, this is an advertisement of an unpopular healer who is seeking customers. This is on the way to Tuba. And this is what he writes Serene Lord Dam is a healer in a fortune teller. Anything you want is available at this location. Your problem will be solved but with it. Serene Lord is very knowledgeable. He is not well known. But now he is doing well. The distance to his place is 500 meters. So it shows you people's preoccupation day to day. Preoccupation. What I find so fascinating is that while African governments and international organizations are treating these Ajami literates as illiterate, companies who are after the money are now understanding there's money to be made here. <laughs> they're now beginning to market <laughs> areas with a high rate of Ajami literates in, in so this one says, water, coal, massage, 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 internet, and they're marketing it in the Murid area. You can tell that this person is Murid in the Tuba area, and you guys work, because there, the rate of Ajami literacy tripled the, the rate of French they're making money. Why the government is treating these people as interest. That's fascinating. For some colleagues who always thought that Ajami is Baru, your Ajami thing is always about religion, I had a counter example. <laughs> <laughs> this is a warning sign I found on a wall. And clearly, the person understood that to get the message across is not French or English that's going to get the message across. So the people who are doing it are literate in this area, in this system. So you don't, then you tell it to yourself for mass communication. But it's not, it's not only that area, just as French, English are used to teach each other languages. We also have local Ajami scholars who are trying to teach survival French. So this part is actually French. This is French Ajami. This is Francais and Pula. <coughs> Bonjour. And thank you for the This guy has identified a local market of people who need to study survival French. And he's trying to teach them. So clearly, the audience he's engaging are already literate in Ajami and not literate in French. He's using Ajami to teach. For those interested in art. The Ajami documents carry beautiful calligraphic traditions. Because calligraphy is part of the educational training in Muslim Africa. 
In some traditions, they emphasize, for example, in the Murid tradition, before you graduate, you have to write a full copy of the Quran. And during the time of the Bamba, the more beautiful the Quran, the more rewarded the world. So decorations became part of the training of people. And that transferred into a general tradition. So this one is a maxim saying, seize whatever you reach. Nothing is done in terms of studies of the material culture that produce these colors. What kind of plants? What kind of minerals? How do they do the composition? Nothing is done. This is open space for students to unpack these sources. This is the poem. And if you search African Ajabi Library, you will find texts like this, a variety of texts. And I want to highlight that what has misled many scholars in the past was that when Muslims write, the first lines are often in good Arabic. These are formulas in the name of God, the merciful, the benefit. But the rest is in Wolof. So because they can't pass the two lines, they have treated this text as undecipherable Arabic, as or unreadable Arabic. But in reality, it's all of the Tausa, the Sunni. And I think we're now at a stage where we can train students to overcome these uh, challenges. Another tradition that is very interesting is what I call music-derived literacy. Some of these people acquire literacy not because they attended Quranic school, because they listen to these beautiful poems in the neighborhood. <laughs> And they're written by these great poets, the local Shakespeare's in Ajami, that uses local maxims, local proverbs, that appeals to them, and they memorize these poems, and they let them decide to decipher the script. They want to learn the script in which the poem is written. So literacy here then is driven by hearing. A visual part came. And that's very interesting, and it's consistent with what African languages tell us, especially West African languages. In many West African languages, the verb to hear is the same as the verb to understand. To hear in Fula, Anani, in Wolof, Dekinger. Some scholars have even argued. But the African American word, you dig it, comes from Wolof, of Wolof origin. So that's the whole debate of whether African Americans were like in English to feel or not. The point being, hearing and understanding are interlaced in the epistemology of West Africa, many West Africans. And that's the reason why songs are very common. Songs are formed of pedagogies to convey. And that's why Ajami texts that are written always have an oral version. And of course, you can buy these texts in a local shop. You can also buy CDs. Now they have upgraded these into YouTube. And this raises the question that I said earlier where do you draw the line between quality? Clearly, these are the forms of continuity. And finally, I cannot complete this presentation without sharing with you this poem, a Mandinka poem. 
This poem was written as a war effort in World War II. Because the scholar who wrote it was angry at Adolf Hitler. Because Seju was a drafting, was a trading post. And as many of you know, four colonies, British colonies, French colonies, and Portuguese colonies, many of these people participated in war efforts, World War II, World War I, uh, Vietnam, and all this. Okay, so people were being drafted in this community among these students, being sent to war. And some of them were coming wounded. And when he asked, he was told it was a it was a European guy called Ikiler. The person who got the name mispronounced it. They pronounced him as Ikiler, and it stuck. So they called him Ikiler. <laughs> <laughs> and in this community, for scholars, for people who whose heart has been cleansed of the sicknesses of the heart, as they say, in the Sufi tradition. People who have elevated themselves through ethical practice, zikr, meditation, who have purified their heart until they have no more anger, jealousy, those features they call the sicknesses of the heart, watch out. They believe that they have the power to bless you, to accelerate your success. That if you were a bad student like I was, and they prayed for you, nothing could stop you. <laughs> but they also believe that if they curse you, nothing could protect you. So this person felt the need to participate in the war effort. Because this person called Hitler, Ikiler, was bringing a lot of problems in his land. So of course he began as a Muslim. This is in Arabic. In the name of God, the merciful, the beneficial, the beneficial, and the rest is in Mandinka. Ikiler the German has brought evil to the world. May God take away all his evil. If he is assisted by powerful demons, may those demons be destroyed. If he is helped by his political skills, may those skills be lost for good. May God bring evil on him so that he may fear himself in his deeds. May God throw thunder on him to destroy his skull and flesh. May he be betrayed by his own doctor. May he make him drink poison until he is unconscious. May the great angels destroy his planes and make them catch fire in the air and fall. Now it's becoming localized, such a home, the effect of the war at home. No young man is here now. You caused our people and our guests to run away. The first person to run away was Arfa Jemme, Kamara, Maroon, and many others. As for Dampa, he's worried for his wife is pregnant and his children can't work. As for Kan Jemme, he, kept, he wept so hard until I felt sad for him. Evil is not good, Ikilea. Declare, may God destroy you inside your protected building, not the bunker. Declare, may you have the sickness of swelling belly and swelling genital. This gives you an idea, if you're a public health specialist, of the available challenges, health challenges of that people. May you feel the agony and cry and die. Amen, amen. May God fulfill our prayers. May the human race be saved from Ikilev's evil. So his concern transcends his community. His concern is that Hitler is a, is a problem for humanity. And he had to bring his own contribution. And he finishes again with an Arabic doxology formula. 
in the name of the Prophet and Sheikh Sadiq, whose curse is worth fear. In this community, they might think they have contributed significantly in the demise of Arab Islam. <laughs> Finally, I talked about Ajami as one of the components of the African library, African sources of knowledge. This is a new source of knowledge that I have not found in any system in the world. It is called the Edo chromatographic writing system. They use shape and color to convey meaning. It's a community at the border between Benin and Nigeria. I have looked around. I haven't found a community where vowels and consonants, minimal pairs, are constructed with color and shape. Nothing is done on the preservation or study of this language. I'm again more interested this beyond the linguistic dimension in the technology that has produced these colors. And how many colors do they have? How do they produce these colors? With what tool? And again, it's an open space that I hope all of you will pick up. The point here is the Ajami traditions, the oral traditions, these chromatographic writing systems and others indigenous local writing systems such as the Bagam, Bamung, Giz, Kapele, Nko, Tifinak, Bai, they all are part of the African language. We need to engage and retrain our students so that the knowledge they produce is left behind. Training so that they can participate in addressing our common challenges in conclusion. The bulk of these African sources remain unstudied. So there are many odysseys of Ajami and indigenous sources of knowledge to be written. You guys have a lot of work there. Because what you are doing is collecting the primary sources for you. Creating programs where they would give you skills so that you could do produce research that we could not so that they don't have access. Some of the recent materials we have collected include translations of the Quran in Wolof and the Bible in Hausa Ajimi, the Genesis. In Hausa Ajimi, we have a copy. And Qadafi's Green Book propaganda materials in Hausa Ajimi. Fuller and Mandinka texts that bear striking similarities with those produced by enslaved Africans in the Americas. Many of the texts that some of the enslaved Africans produced in the Americas remain in the stacks in some libraries and referred to as the Arabic or unreadable Arabic. In reality, the Ajami, Hausa Ajami, some texts in Brazil, the Malay report, revealed that some of the texts in Malay, in Brazil, and the Malay during the Malay report, studied by uh, Nikolai Dobrovin in Russia, revealed that many of the documents were Ajami. Some were bilingual, Mandinka, Ajami, and Hausa. So these communities are not different from the communities you see today that I showed you that are multilingual in Arabic and in local languages. So there are many parts of Africans displaced in Africa and displaced outside of Africa in the Americas, including North America. 
and literacy have been erased. But we now have an opportunity to study those texts and to create connections of Africans displaced from Africa centuries ago in ways we were not able to do for the technology. And so these materials are those to be unearthed. When seriously studied, they force revisions of various aspects of our understanding of Islam in Africa, pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial Africa, and in that Atlantic slave trade. Because many of the slaves who were captured during war, including jihad movements, that occurred, were already literate. According to Usman Khan, the population of Muslims who were enslaved were in about now, based on the research, most recent research, about 20%. Many of them lived in areas with learning centers. The early explorers who came in, French explorers in Senegambia, for example, noted that the people, the local people, were more literate in Arabic and local languages than the average French peasant at that time. So I think we now have an opportunity to expand our understanding of Africa that go beyond all languages. The African language is multilingual. We could written oral. Arabic-based and non-Arabic-based indigenous systems that we need to engage. 